I would like to thank the organizers of this innovation symposium for inviting me to speak to you today. And as you all understood from this long introduction, I'm a tech junkie. I never majored <laughs> in humanities. I never majored <laughs> in social studies. I was always in the sciences. Now, what I'm going to talk to you today, one colleague of mine helped me to come up with a title to attract you to the talk, right? Uh, because if I would have written it as the biotechnology frontiers, we would all have fallen asleep before I started, right? <laughs> so I want to talk to you about food. We all eat. We all believe that we can grow food. We can buy food. What I'm going to talk to you about, I believe that we're coming to the time when growing food is becoming biotechnology. And I want to show you something which recently made me interested in that. So the word is very popular now in Europe and Israel. It's much more popular than in the States. And I believe the reason is that we have a lot of natural resources, right? We even don't think how lucky we are. The density of population in the States is much lower than like in Western Europe, to say nothing about Asian countries like China and India. We have amazing natural resources. That's why we live in luxury. We started recycling 20 years later than Germany did. Let's talk about aquaponics. What is aquaponics? This is an artificial ecological system. What is ecological system? It's when everything is recycled and is sustainable, right? So we have a fish here. I don't know how to press to use it as a pointer, but I'll try. So we have fish. They live. They need nutrition. They have waste. Their waste can be transferred uh, by bacteria, special type of bacteria, into the nutrition for the plant. That's how we close the circle, right? Theory is beautiful here. Fish, bacteria, and the plant. We can grow the plant. We can grow the fish. We need to balance three metabolism of nitrogen not to kill the fish and not to kill the plant. And the key here is the work of this bacteria, which do the turnover of the different forms of nitrogen. Now, what is the advantage and why I'm bringing it to your attention? We save up to 95% of water as compared to the aquaculture. We all buy farm-raised salmon, right? It is a closed cycle. Now, what I want to tell you is that the aquaponics was initially invented in ancient China, which was many <laughs> centuries ago. But it was an open system. And they didn't, have, they didn't have the knowledge of biotechnology, which we have today. And again, a special attention here is brought to the nitrification, which was discovered by the Russian microbiologist, and which means basically that we have a turnover in the nature. We have a turnover of different ammonia, nitrate, nitrate, different nitrogen compounds, some of them which we can include in our metabolism and use as nutrients, and some we cannot. So if we have certain levels which are above the threshold of some of this metabolism, for example, ammonia, the fish will die. Or if nitrate level go, nitrite level goes high, the fish can die. But if the nitrate level is lower, then the plant will die. So the function of the bacteria which uh, regulate the cycle of nitrogen is essential not to kill the fish and not to kill the plant and to have them peacefully coexisting and growing. So now I want to explain to you why aquaponics, right? Why I'm here in this session, why it is relating to the world. I bet everybody in this room has read about what California is already doing with their fresh water, right? Unfortunately, pollution is not only in China. I feel for Chinese pollution, but I also feel for ours. It is a very recent publication. People in Pennsylvania, in their rivers, they find fish tumors. I don't think we would like to eat this fish or feed it to our family members, right? And we all understand that our population will grow very fast. This is a projection for the population growth in the US alone, in our country. And it is very fast. So we can expect over 600 million population soon, which is still nothing as compared to the density of population in Western Europe and 
Asian countries, but it is a significant more load for our resources. Now I want to tell you a little bit about how aquaponics is being done today. So I did some survey, I did some research, I tried to, I did some first awkward steps myself, and if you would like me to summarize it in one word, it would be chaos. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so there are people uh, with initiatives, uh, there are some organizations which are trying to promote it, and there are some fundamental uh, things which I believe prevented uh, from being widespread now and which needs to be resolved by science, which basically brings me today to this audience. So the portable farms were started by a family of scientists from UC Davis who believe that they came up with the aquaponic system which can be grown everywhere. They sell the class, they sell uh, the system. You can buy it and start growing it in your backyard. What is the caveat here? You have to come up with the design of the housing yourself. And you have to maintain the temperature and humidity year round. In our climate, to have indoors 70 degrees for growing tilapia is not cheap. And this is the question which has to be solved for our climate. In California, cooling it <laughs> and saving water is more important. We have a different problem. It is climate dependent, right? So the next piece of this puzzle comes from the Growing Power. It's a non-profit organization. I took a three-day class with them. It's very impressive. Will Allen is a very known uh, figure, I believe. I'm, I don't know if anybody in the room knows about him. Will Allen is a person who, he was a professional basketball player. Then he was a corporate executive. And then he started his own urban farm in Milwaukee. And uh, he made it, um, he was raised on a farm. He has the roots from the farming. His approach is applying all the skills of a farmer to use aquaponics, which he brought from the University of Wisconsin freshwater department. So for heating, he uses huge piles of composting. And he uses um, very simple, cost-efficient designs for growing the fish, making fish tanks and growing the fish. He achieved amazing result. His yellow perch, which is a delicacy there in Midwest, grows three times faster in his system than it does in nature. The uh, yellow perch is prohibited for fishing in the States because the Great Lakes are poisoned with mercury, as we know. They are caught only in Canada. So this organization is not plugging into the advancements of biotechnology. They're using the farmer's approaches to overcome the cost uh, issue and the issue of the quality of the food. If we have recycling water, it needs to be pure. The parts have to be pure of le the leaking chemicals. Otherwise, we enrich the fish with toxins as we do with farm-raised fish a lot. So, and here is another version which actually, this is a picture from my living room. That's where I grow it. It is commercially available at pet store. The company is called Back to the Roots. This was started by two UC Berkeley graduates in biology who decided to promote uh, home food, uh, food growing. And this is one of them. I want to show you one more thing here. <laughs> if you heard about the website called Kickstarter, there's a guy who is trying uh, to fundraise $50,000 to start aquaponic system to grow yellow perch in his own backyard in Pennsylvania. <laughs> so it's chaos and it's starting. What are the bottlenecks? As I told you, green energy, we ha it has to be cost efficient. It has to be biotechnology savvy because we need to keep the same critical process parameters I'm done, Anna, uh, to keep the, everybody happy in the system. And obviously, we have to optimize the bacteria to speed up the conversion. Well, this is my take home message. And again, thank you very much for letting me bring you this technology today. I believe it's coming. I believe once this problem will be solved by interdisciplinary tech junkie approach. <laughs>
it may become routine for delivering food to us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Uh, so now we have time for some questions. And where do I see the first question? John. Thank you. Um, I guess mine is really a, a point of, of clarification. Um, by the term aquaponics, is that equivalent to hydroponics um, that I grew up with in, 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 in school, in college science? And if it's not, what would be the distinction? Thank you. Hydroponics is growing plants in water instead of soil with supply nutrients. Aquaponics adds a layer to that because we now use the fish to generate the nitrogen compounds as their exhaust, waste, poop, whatever we call it, which is metabolized by the microorganisms into nitrates, which are the food for the plant. So we want to supply the food to the plants from the fish and at the same time to grow the fish because we take the waste product away so we can have higher density of the fish in the tank. Did I, did I make it clear? Yes, yes, it's, it's really carrying it quite a step further. And, yeah. We create an ecological system, micro artificial ecological system as compared to hydroponic. Thank you for Hi, I'm not a biologist, but I, am a, I do have my um, license to go out and, and get clams and other things and I'm interested in this type of thing but I'm interested um, the, the the bacteria you're talking about is that coming naturally from the poop or is there the balance have to be maintained by some other me means it is not coming from the poop because everything is closed with the water water is circulating in the system there is a tank which has started with this bacteria so the system I showed you, which grows in my living room, there is a special, uh, very porous material and a life system to initiate the bacteria because everything is set as a t kit for the kids to have the aquaponic system. The growing power, where I took a class, they take a big bowl of sand and they just grow this bacteria naturally. It takes them two weeks to start the system working. But it's a special third element. Hi, Maggie. You said that uh, the water has to be clean. I one wonder uh, where, where you get the water for your project in your house. From my tab. <laughs> but I have. <laughs> so frankly speaking, I had two options. It's a really good question. Thank you. So we buy water in gallons, um, but also I have the cleaning uh, thing on the tab water. You know, yeah. Michael, if you're <clears throat> if you're growing your own fish at home, and a person is not as highly trained as you are, is is there a danger that they could make a mistake and that would affect the, the food safety or food quality of the fish? That's what worries me. I thank you very much. I think it's a very good question. When I was taking this three day class, they were showing us the materials which they buy, which are readily available, and which are cheap. Because if you want to overcome the cost of goods and make it common, widespread, you are worried about cost of goods. And I was thinking, uh, if anybody ever made analytics of the volatiles extracts, what is not good with our extracting organics, but at the same time, I think there should be a special control for these materials. I think it's one of the bottlenecks for the technology to really thrive. Mm. Yeah, so um, has anyone done an analysis of the fruits, vegetables, whatever, grown in this system to see if the actual um, product, the plants, have absorbed any harmful uh, substances like aluminum or, you know, whatever pesticides or whatever you could get harmfully from, potentially from your system? As I told you, it, it's in the level of cares. This is my Personal subjective yeah, opinion. Yeah. Uh, truly yours tried the food and the fish grown in Milwaukee. It was it tasted delicious. They didn't use aluminum. These are people who try to do everything as similar to the farming original as possible. I don't think it's the mainstream for this technology to thrive, but it is a version which gives safe food. <laughs>
Yeah, it's a very simple thing to take some fruits and vegetables and run them through a, an HPLC to see what comes out in terms of potentially harmful substances. Oh, that's very true. I am not aware of anybody doing that. I, I, I'm sure, right? Even TLC could do this. I was just going to say, I, I happen to be part of a startup business in Colorado uh, as a coach, and they used the geothermal wells in the San Luis Valley, and they raised the fish in the flow from the geothermal wells, which kept the temperature constant, and then they collected the waste from the fish, and they used it as fertilizer, and then they processed the plants uh, via chickens. They, they fed the the plants to the chickens, they sold the chickens, and they took the chicken waste and used it to make the fish food. <laughs> and uh, the, the flavor of the fish they got, tilapia, was so amazing because of the minerals in the geothermal uh, that they're getting $10, $12 a pound for it. Uh, and so they've come up with a sustainable model around yeah. this, uh, but at some scale. But you may want to research what they've done there. And, and it's been copied by the prisoners, and the prisoners are growing fish uh, for market as well, because there's a big geothermal well near one of the big prisons. Well, thank you very much for expanding my horizons. I missed it. I would appreciate it if you could give me a note on that, because it's a very interesting application of that. I was. The point is, there's a lot of evidence that it works. You get very healthy fish, um, and the waste can be reused. But the biggest problem we ran into was managing the temperature, because it's so expensive. And yes. geothermal wells solves that problem if you build one of these near a ge geothermal well. That's very true. That's why yellow perch, which Milwaukee team is growing, is easier than tilapia, because it is naturally cold climate fish. But this fish is very, it cannot survive more than 2 ppm of ammonia, while tilapia can survive 300 ppm which makes it chemically easy. But yellow perch uh, gives you a freedom of, of lower temperature control. <coughs> but they're talking, I am only biological junkie. I don't know if, the, <laughs> if all the solar panels and all the green energy, but I believe that once this kicks in, this will become mainstream food growth, which will be cost efficient. Geothermal water is an interesting example. of uh, Milwaukee University also published uh, published a piece about how you can use the climate and the sun rays and fall for building more um, heat preserving outdoors facility greenhouse for for these things outdoors next question anybody last question all right Thank you. Well, on that note, thank you very much. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you.